afternoon or good morning, everybody, and welcome to State Living's first webinar um, for the uh, 2021. Um, we are very excited to be hosting a property developer series to start off the year with, and we will be hosting these webinars throughout the course of the year, talking to different topics, different audiences. We've changed our system slightly. They're not, uh, a shorter webinar, 45 minutes, that includes uh, uh, 30 or uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. So please use uh, the chat box to send your questions. Uh, let me, before we get going, let me um, give you a few house rules. I'm sure most of us cut our teeth on webinars last year, but for those of you who haven't, We've enabled the chat from this particular webinar, so all your questions can go into the chat area that's at the bottom of your screen. Those questions are also recorded and we will answer them throughout the course of the webinar. Um, the during Also during the course of the webinar, we will have uh, four different polls. The poll question pops up onto your screen. You can answer it and uh, then click on the red button at the top and to remove the poll. Uh, the panelists, your poll will also come up onto your screen. Uh, you can just click on the red square and uh, remove it so that it's out of your way. Um, we have a small panel today. Uh, we are talking about property development funding, uh, guarantees, growth opportunities and risk appetite. Um, coming out of SONA 2021, I think this is a great opportunity for us to understand um, what has happened in 2020, what that means for the industry and where the opportunities lie and how are the financial institutions viewing these opportunities. So before we start, uh, let me let our panel do a quick introduction. Uh, we have Dr. Rudolf uh, Goethe here with us today, who's the South African economist and the head of real, uh, real estate at Santum, uh, uh, Cole Bishop. And perhaps, Cole, you could just quickly introduce yourself and then uh, Dr. Goethe. Thank you, Louise. Good morning, everybody. Um, Paul Bishop, Head of uh, Real Estate at uh, Suntum Limited. Um, prior to that, I've spent many years within the, the banking and financing industry of, uh, in particular, commercial property finance. Um, you know, so balancing both of the, the risk elements from a real estate perspective in insurance and also having been on the, the funding side as well. And looking forward to uh, being part of the discussion today. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, Carl. And Dr. Goethe? Yes, good, uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I've been around for a while. Uh, I mean, I have teenage grandchildren, <laughs> just for the record, um, in any event. So I started my career as an accountant. I hope you won't hold that against me. I did see the light, moved into economics via journalism. Uh, was financial editor of a daily newspaper, economic policy advisor at National Treasury uh, when we had um, zero public debt. <laughs> I'll take some of the credit for that. Um, and since then, I've been uh, concentrating on uh, uh, lecturing and research. Uh, I'm currently the economic advisor to the Optimum Investment Group, a uh, brilliant company as far as ethics and returns are concerned. And I'm also the editor of a publication called The Bright Side, which is published by Currencies Direct. Uh, Graham Barrett is the guy in charge there and Abel Skuman. Um, and any viewers that uh, want to receive this on a monthly basis, it also has, it includes a, a, a publication called Currency Compass. So on a monthly basis, I calculate the real effective exchange rate of the RAND and I determine what the undervaluation is, the level of undervaluation, what it should be trading at against the US dollar. I think that's useful information. So if you want to just pop an email to Currencies Direct, ask them to get uh, on the mailing list. It's only once a month. And it, it's a publication designed to make cynics weep because uh, I pick up, uh, you know, the positive stuff like Ford's investment, uh, the rand is strengthened by 4.2% since 31 January, uh, things like that. So uh, that's it, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wetsi. Yeah, Cur we, we, um, Currency Directs is also an affiliate of Estate Living. So uh, yeah, it's a very, I do receive that, that notification and publication that you mentioned, and it is very interesting 
to stay abreast with what's happening. So I think let's start with you. If you could, we're going to set the stage. Um, maybe you can just give us a rundown of where sort of where we currently are coming out of 2021. Um, sorry, coming out of 2020. And um, and yeah, let's hear some of this good news that um, you've been sharing with us over the last few days. So I'm going to hand over the reins to yourself, uh, Dr. Goethe, and there we go. Right, uh, let's uh, get cracking. So uh, the property sector is bound to take off again. Um, please interrupt me if things, something goes wrong with the slides, but I don't think it would. We've had several checks, I must say. Uh, Louise uh, crosses her T's and dots her I's, which is a very good thing. So there we have the South African long-term long -term bond yield. And my challenge to the viewers is to, um, to the audience is to count the V's, uh, the V-shaped uh, slides. This is the first one. You may wonder what I put in my coffee this morning. Uh, but what you should imagine here is the value of bonds, our bonds, because the bond yield and the value of a bond are inversely correlated. So when the bond yield goes down, it means that the value of the bond is increasing. As, as you can clearly see, in line with my forecast, which I made um, uh, at the end of March, uh, uh, I was the laughing stock of the economics profession when I said that the so long-term bond yield would decline by 300 basis points within four months. And that's exactly what happened. The decent economists have phoned me to apologize. Uh, the others I don't care too much about. Um, this is very good news for us. Uh, this is another V and you may once again wonder what, <laughs> how, I, how I can construct a V from, from this uh, very volatile slide. But if you take the value of the RAND sort of uh, in the beginning of 2020 uh, and you take it to its low point uh, above 19 and where it is today it's under uh, it's headed for 14 by the way if you were to cut that out then you'll see a v uh, but uh, once again it doesn't look like a v because this is the price of a dollar if you calculate the, the, the there is a, there is a procal you'll see that the rent has staged a nice recovery and in fact it between 6 april and 31 December last year uh, reminded me of our Springboks. The RAND was the number one currency in the world in terms of its strengthening against the US dollar. So well uh, done to, to us. The oil price recovery, usually not good news, but there's another V. Uh, that means the world economy is growing again. This is the most pronounced V that I can find because the, uh, you know the Chinese have got to work ethic second to none, is the second largest economy in the world. And they got their um, they got their, their crash two months before we did the rest of the world, but look where the the purging managers index is now. It's just heading one way, which is very good news for us, by the way, uh, and one of the reasons why shares like um, Sassel and Kumba are doing so exceptionally well. Not to mention Impala Platz and Sabania. Um, yeah, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven V's. Once again, uh, you may wonder where the V comes from. If you were to include the 2019 actual growth rates of these seven countries, then you will see a very clear V in every case. Uh, there's another one. Well, another two new vehicle sales, not quite where they were, but getting there. used vehicles, uh, as you can see, uh, are doing better than they've ever done before. And that's quite predictable. Actually, um, it has been said that the definition of a statistician uh, is somebody will tell you that if your feet are in the oven and your head is in the freezer, on average, you are quite comfortable. Uh, I wouldn't do that um, if, if I were you. Uh, on that point, I just want to also mention if you do get the business maverick under the opinionistas uh, columns right at the end, uh, there's an article which I published this morning to just set the record straight. Uh, Ed Stoddard, one of their uh, Associates wrote an article a uh, couple of days ago creating the impression that business confidence in South Africa is at a crisis level so low uh, th that's how low it is and um, maybe he was smoking his socks I'm not sure because um, the uh, APSA uh, Bureau of Economic Research is telling Bosch their purchasing managers index which is a one of the best parameters of business confidence in this country recently at a level of 60, 60, the highest in 20 years. So I just put that record straight. You're welcome to have a look at that. And this is a, 
a really a, a fascinating slide and close to the bone of the property sector because look what's happened to mortgage advances um, uh, and, and it, it tells a story of South Africa's recent history there you can see the low interest rates that's good for property state capture uncertainty corruption bad for property Ramaphosa's election good for property COVID-19 <laughs> okay let, we don't have to say anything about that and look, look at this and, and I love this because I predicted a year ago that we would see a recovery of this indicator because we've got the lowest interest rates in 50 years five zero years um, it, it, it's really looking good on that score there's another V mineral sales new all-time record high thanks especially to platinum and iron ore uh, retail trade sales interesting slide you can see the December spikes over there. Uh, that's when we get bonuses and go Christmas shopping. But since Black Friday and Cyber Monday started, we've got the first part of the spike in November. And this year's uh, November spike was more or less on par with last year. Once again, a virtually full recovery. Manufacturing sales, same story, another V. Afrimat Construction Index, this must be good news, heartening news for President Ramaphosa because the, uh, the infrastructure projects are slowly but surely gaining momentum. And this tells you that uh, the activity is happening out there. That was also recently confirmed by Pretoria Port and Cement with uh, a huge increase in their cement sales. The JSE All Share Index, unbelievable news. All time record high. There's a cynical adage which says, uh, Ask the question, poses a question, how do you make a small fortune on the JSE? Uh, the answer to that is uh, you start with a big one, and that's certainly not the case. Um, so uh, if you had bought some shares, uh, at maybe even Satrix uh, 40 at the end of March, you would have made a killing. And that's what the guys at Optimum uh, tried to do for us. Uh, value of building plans passed by the larger municipalities. Once again, very good news. Construction is the most labor intensive sector of the economy and this is exceptionally good news uh, real also trade sales of building materials also uh, getting right back up to speed and then <clears throat> the question of interest rates i get asked a lot will rates increase this year the answer is absolutely not um, unless those uh, hawks at the monetary policy committee um, unless something terribly terrible goes wrong they, they should get the message now that inflation is about to drop to below their lower target range for inflation there is absolutely how can there be high inflation if the rand is strengthening gradually and there is insufficient demand in the economy uh, i've tried to explain that to some of them and hopefully it'll sink in at some point in time so we can look forward to a prime rate of probably 7% right up to 2023. I believe that. Uh, I may not be correct, but I think we'll, we get, we're we headed for a, a very long period of very stable uh, interest rates. That is obviously good news for uh, the, the property sector. Uh, we obviously still have some problems uh, around uh, government bureaucracy, uh, incompetence. Um, the reason why they changed the streets in Pretoria into one-way streets many years ago, I was still uh, doing my articles at an auditing firm, is to prevent the, uh, the civil servants from uh, those that arrive late from obstructing those that want to leave early <laughs> to go home. So uh, just on a lighter note. Now, according to Bloomberg and Morningstar Direct, property uh, has been uh, in the dog box for a decade. And we must just remember one thing that the last 10 years, uh, more or less um, until 2018, in any event, uh, this country was this country's executive leader allowed a bunch of crooks, literally crooks, to more or less take over state owned enterprises in this country and to some extent also the public service. And this is a fact. If you don't believe me, follow the proceedings of the Zonu Commission, please, by all means. Now, this, uh, the Zuptas are slowly but surely uh, being rounded up. More than 100 people uh, are already being prosecuted since Shamila Botoy took over. Sol Ramaphosa won the presidency of this country on an anti-corruption ticket. And although he only won the presidency of the ANC by a very small margin, 
he is slowly but surely starting to deliver on his promises. But he, he has to watch his back all the time because there are still a couple of crooks around. I've got really bad news for them. Bottom line, what I want to tell you is that it is it is time for property. In, in economics, we turn Newton's law on its head. What goes down must go up again. And I think we are headed for really good days for property in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Buerta. <laughs> and thank you for the uh, anecdotes in between there. If there are any civil servants watching, I do apologize. Um, we will put a disclaimer <laughs> on the bottom. Um, so, you know, it's, it, I, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to hold what I have to say back. And I'm going to first let us hand over to Cole, because I think this is really where now we look at a large financial institution that is from, that is focusing on funding and property guarantees and insurance and paying in the space. Um, what is what is Cole? What is your and Santom's current view position on the market? And would you agree with Dr. Ruloff's um, analysis? Yeah, thanks. So. Um... Without trying to uh, uh, summarize uh, Dr. Dr. Worth's presentation, but my, my takeaway in Centrum it is that, as 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 relates to property, there are plenty and enough of the correct indicators pointing in the right and positive direction, right? And that's certainly a view that that we have as 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 a Sun Tum group. I suppose last year we all um, got to know. The V's and U's are, are the is the recovery a V recovery is the recovery a U recovery and or is it somewhere in between all of those? But certainly, I do agree from what we've seen. There are many many V's. Um, if I just take uh, some analysis we did towards the end of last year, uh, around October November last year, and just purely in the residential property sector, the average value of the of mortgage bonds granted and, and the doctor had a, um, a slide similar to that from 2019 October 2019 to October 2020 that value had gone up by 20 percent so the average value ended up at around 120,000 rand per bond application versus 780,000 rand the year before so again just just an, another example of, of positive indicators I think what you also have to understand is that Property is a very broad class, a broad category, and and there are there are many let's call them sub sub segments with within the property environment. And you know whether we're talking residential and within residential property, there's there's various categories in, in the commercial sector, in the retail sector, in the hospitality sector, and so on. And we'll get into more detail as, as discussion goes, but. Certainly, as from from where I sit and where we sit within the Suntum group, we are op optimistic about about the real estate market. We, we certainly are optimistic about the property market, and we certainly believe that there's enough indicators um, to to show that that recovery um, will will be there. I suppose it's always the question: how long is it going to be? But if you're sitting as as, as a buyer, you know. Uh, like Dr. Bertha pointed out, uh, the cost of you purchasing your property now is cheaper than it's ever been in the last 50 years. If you're sitting as a developer of property or an investor in, into property, your your source of funding now is also at the, the, the cheapest it's ever been in, in a really long time. Let me stop there for for, for now. I would I, I would. Agree. Agree with. I think that there's a general consensus with the interest rates lower. That you know we're on the, all on the same page that the cost to to for funding has reduced. Yet, folks are still struggling to access that funding. So whether that's a developer or an end user, there are challenges in the market with regards to accessing funding. What what have you found that your clients are experiencing? You know, where do you where have you um, identified those challenges? Oh. Yes, and you're right. Although the, the let's call it the cost of funding is cheaper, and the funding is available, I think that's also a very important element to to understand that that there is money for development, um, both locally and internationally. The 
the access to that to that funding is is really the issue and it, to me it comes down to to created access let's call it that in the in a broad category um i always look back and say all right what what is similar to what's happening now to in, in the past and i can go back to around 2007 2008 um you know with that financial crisis and if we just look at the year or two after after that played out sentiment in in my opinion is is really the hindrance and the attitude to towards credit extension um maybe rightly so uh from from the the, the funders themselves you know because there, there are also some warning signs as to affordability uh job losses repayability uh buyers themselves being able to afford the credit um you know so so those are all factors that do come into play when when uh, granting access to that funding but getting access certainly is a challenge and seeing that i think what the real the, the other besides let's call it the um the sort of sentiment and attitude in the overall general market and maybe people don't necessarily understand what the next step is or or is there a third wave or a fourth wave you know we, we don't necessarily know so so we can park that i think the the next thing is is that people's balance sheets have also taken a knock over the last few years so security and uh, surety is also uh, a challenge for both on an individual basis and also from from developers as well um we also just have to look at the the listed property sector as well and and what those balance sheets look like from 2 years ago to now um you know that that plays out a point i'm just using that as as an example but uh, and no so some of our developer developer clients as well um balance sheets have taken a knock and i think um in in uncertain times security and surety also becomes a, a very important part of accessing funding um so so there is almost a, and maybe dr butcher could jump in here there is almost like a bit of a contradiction here we've got we're seeing an we're seeing an improvement across the board in industry but at the same time we're seeing an increase in job losses we have hopes for the property industry because we're seeing the increase in sales but we still have um a, a huge uh, unsure you know the securities around um, accessing finance seems to be in, in question here. Um, could you, based on what's happening in the market, and we're talking specifically in property, do you think that your analysis is still correct? Do you still see the industry uh, recovering? Um, you know, is it a bit of a false economy, Dr. Boerta? You're the expert here. I mean, how do you explain this sort of contradiction between access and, and growth? Yes, certainly. Um, I, I would like to mention that I have won the Economist of the Year Award based on the accuracy of my forecast, not my the, the variety of my uh, humor. Um, and I think I've got a very good chance of uh, winning it on the basis of 2020's forecast. Uh, all the economists, uh, there's about 40 of us that participate, uh, would have gotten the GDP more or less correct, etc. But where I blew them out of the water, was with the exchange rate. I mean, most of these guys were talking. You, you have to you have to forecast what the average exchange rate is in the in the last quarter, um, or oh, sorry, the last month of the year. Uh, and and they were talking 16, 17, and I and I saw 15 coming, uh, even below 15. So I got that one right. I don't always get it right, but when I do, I tell people. Um, now, as far as the property recovery is concerned, uh, I'm, I must uh, be quite honest now. Uh, I've been forecasting this for quite a while uh, and it has to happen and and my common sense tells me and the indicators tell me it's going to happen right now now Carl mentioned the balance sheet effect which and he's entirely correct of course but uh, there have been some interesting developments now it depends on, it depends which assets and liabilities you've got you know your debt servicing costs have gone down uh, and of course if if uh, You've got a lot of properties in your portfolio uh, and the location is maybe a little bit of a problem then certainly you took a knock but as far as your investment in equities are concerned 
is, is concerned. I mean, that looks unbelievable. Um, and, and I would like to believe a lot of people after the dividend season is over will probably cash in a little bit on their capital gains. I mean, if you bought uh, a Sassel or 30 Rand a couple of months ago, it's trading at 200 now. Um, and it won't be paying dividends for another year or two. So maybe that's a good uh, that's a good call. So the balance sheet effect, uh, I like to refer to this as the wealth effect, because remember, um, I think there's every single investment portfolio, certainly at optimum as uh, bank banks, you know, the banks, APSA, NetBank, FNB, the, the lot of them invest tech in there. And uh, the word is that the Reserve Bank actually forbade them to pay dividends, even though they were still making profits. So we didn't get the uh, second half of the year uh, dividends. Those dividends will, will start flowing again. And obviously that will sort of enhance the wealth effect. And that's why, I mean, uh, I can see a property market boom coming al along uh, in the course of, of uh, 2021. It'll be relatively slow. Uh, just a quick a pointer. 15 million people have been vaccinated in the UK. Look at the, look at the, the, the pound. Look at the pound. Now, South African rand has strengthened by 4% against the dollar since 31 January. If we start vaccinating, who knows? I mean, a rand at 12 rand, 12.50 to the dollar is not impossible as we as, as we go along. Um, and I can see also see recovery for and direct investment. But the big news is the workspace revolution. Nobody knows exactly how this is going to pan out. Um, working from home has got so many dimensions. Working from any everywhere, anywhere is the new buzzword. Apparently, I think you guys more uh, know more about that than I do. So it's it's. I must tell you, I wish I was a bit younger because there are so many opportunities this year. Absolutely, it's interesting that so so with the and maybe I can sort of look a call uh, direct this question to you. So. Looking at opportunities, and I think let's go on the word opportunities. So how is how are you viewing the different types of development? So where are you seeing opportunities for growth in which sectors of with specific to development? Sure. So I'll, I'll go back to an earlier comment. Um, the, the real estate sector is, is a large sector and, and there are various elements within that where we see certain amount of opportunity. So, so can, let me start on the flip side of that and say, um, if you're looking to to develop hospitality assets at the moment, um, you're not going to get access to funding, and that opportunity is not going going to play out for obvious reasons. However, if you have cash, as Dr. Bort pointed out, pointed out, and and you and you're sitting. On, on disposable cash, that's actually an opportunity for you within the hospitality property space because now you have the opportunity to acquire hospitality assets at, at far, far cheaper than, than what they potentially could be. So we're seeing some of our clients thinking about that already. Let's move over into, let's call it the, the office sector. Office sector, as we know, is struggling. Nobody really knows what 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 is going to play out in the next uh you know, year, two years, when it comes to office space and the use of office space, um, the days of developers coming and saying, I've got uh, five year leases or 10 year leases from a strong blue chip who signed up and is taking up 90% of the building and accessing funding against that is, is I, w I won't say gone, but it's, it's very difficult now because of that uncertainty right now. So, uh, one would have to be cautious. Um, we're not seeing much activity happening in that sector. Let's change tax slightly now and maybe look into the residential sector. There are certainly pockets um, within the, let's call it the mid-segment um, in the residential space. If you're developing up to, let's call it 10 million rand selling price for, for your units, um, there certainly is. Um, wonderful opportunity then we're seeing there's a lot of activity and a lot of buyer uptake remember it's 30 percent cheaper now and or affordability for a buyer what they could afford a year ago they can afford 30 percent more essentially right so and we're seeing uh, activity there we're also seeing activity in the lifestyle estates um, people want to be more connected and uh, sort of what we're calling the multi-generational living 
where you have an element of, uh, let's call it older retirement assisted living uh, ability. You have the smaller uh, units, sort of block style, and then you have uh, also sections where you have more freestanding units. So you can actually go what I call go through the generations as a first time home buyer. Then you have your family, we have those, and then we have the retirement element all within within the same area. So yes, those are larger developments and those those take time, but we're certainly seeing the attractiveness of um, an estate like that as well. We're then also seeing within, let's call it the, I hate this term, but the, the, the lower end of the market where there's a huge housing backlog. I mean, I, and I'll say it again, there's, there's a massive housing backlog and we know that uh, with, within South Africa. So developer clients that are looking to provide housing and housing units with, within, let's call it the affordable sector of the market, are also seeing uh, there's wonderful opportunities there and, and accessing that sort of financing a little bit easier than, let's call it the older traditional type of, type of developments. So, you know, very quickly, those are some of the pockets where, where we, we're seeing a lot of activity, where we're seeing that those are the opportunities that, uh, that, that do exist. Thanks, Carl. So would you say that, you know, we talk about these opportunities in these different sectors. Do we do you think that and this is maybe just like a maybe not a relevant enough question, but do you think it's in the affordable sector? Do you think people are, you know, that are earning that sort of 20,000 Rand or that 15 to 25,000 Rand income as a household are purchasing property within that sector? Or is, do you think it's more of an opportunist investor that's looking at the sector, seeing the opportunity for growth, you know, buying a number of units, renting them out? Is it, you know, would you say that, that the homes are, is it, would you say that those types of investors are kind of seeing blood on the streets at the moment, for the lack of a better term, and are buying up units at, within different prices? You know, it, it is a relevant question, um, and I think it's a bit of both, actually. Right. So, so, so we we do see uh, developer clients who are being successful with the developments in that area and pricing uh, up to the seven hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand rand mark. Let's call it that, and and those units move very quickly on a sales basis. Absolutely, we see that. We also see the other side where where the units are being developed to, to be let out to, to, to tenants because there is an element of the market, which I said earlier, where affordability is still an issue right, over, over the last couple of years. So um, maybe they don't have credit access, but they can still rent out the units. And if, and if your product is right, we're still seeing that as an opportunity. What's interesting also further, and it, this kind of plays into potentially um, the world of work and where we're going to work and how we're going to work in the future is we're seeing some of the developers um, who are in the, the conversion space or redevelopment space, let's call it that, and repurposing uh, office blocks that would be 80, 90% vacant and turning those into, let's call them the more smaller units, right? and and buyers who will live close to, uh, you know, shopping center convenience, have uh, great connectivity in our sort of more financial hubs, uh, uh, you know, around South Africa. We, we're seeing that as, as a wonderful opportunity where a young professional says, I can afford 1.2, 1.3, 1 1.4 million rand. There's my unit and it's gone. And it's been actually reconfigured from a, uh, uh, an office, an old office block that's now con converted into a unit. And those are also becoming more and more um, as, as opportunities. 
Um, just a question for Dr. Bueto. Um, going back to market analysis, you know, we, before we started this webinar, I did ask Carl the question of what you, and we will get to it, you know, what sort of, when they look at their rating model, what do they see as a fav more favorable investment or more favorable funding opportunity? And one of the things that comes into play is security of services. So access to internet, security around water, security around power. Looking at your analysis of the market, do you think that insecurity around water, electricity, water, power, and technology will affect your projection? Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, in in all the metros and most of the larger municipalities, uh, it, it's not a situation that there is no electricity. On the odd occasion, there is no electricity. Um, since the writer took over at ESCOM, the uh, average uh, number of load shedding hours has come down dramatically, despite the fact that we're generating more electricity now than we did before we arrived there. So certainly we're moving in the right direction. When he, when he took over ESCOM, he said, after a couple of weeks, he said in his first media interview, there is not one single problem at ESCOM that cannot be solved with the right skills and the right policies. And the same holds for South Africa for our municipalities. Yes, a third of our municipalities are bankrupt because of incompetence, nepotism, corruption, fraud, and theft. Uh, and But slowly but surely, these people are being taken to task. And I'm convinced that the new partnership approach between Cyril Ramaphosa and his top team, well, uh, and government, and the private sector, that this partnership approach will bear fruit. Um, obviously, he's a politician as well, uh, and he needs, Jan Smits, uh, the great Jan Smits once was asked, what is a, a, a member of parliament's first task? And he said, you must get reelected. Um, so uh, he, he needs to watch his back as well a little bit. But, but I'm convinced that we're moving in the right direction as far as that's concerned. And by the way, most of the private developers know how to make sure that there is electricity. Uh, the solar electricity revolution is is going to take over uh, a lot of our problems as far as that's concerned. But this creates obviously also opportunities for developers and in downstream activity. I would like to share with the viewers an interesting little snippet, uh, which I picked up on today's Business Maverick. Um, it's Tim Cohen's column, which is just about two uh, headings above my, my own one uh, this morning, where he talks about uh, an annual survey that gets done on, on confidence levels in uh, government, NGOs, the media, and um, the private sector, uh, business leaders, uh, and, and business leaders, the public has a hell of a lot more faith in, in business leaders than, than in government, quite frankly, and, and I can understand why. But interesting point is, in South Africa's case, the, the trust that the public has in government has increased significantly since Cyril Ramaphosa became president. Okay, it wasn't a very hard act to follow because the previous guy was just so useless, it's unbelievable. Um, but and, in, interesting point, job security. Job security has emerged from this survey, the Edelman survey, it's, it's quite authoritative, as a greater concern than contracting COVID-19. And I can understand that. I can understand that. So um, in, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, Tito Bobini will be delivering his budget. And the bright side, published by Currencies Direct, end of this month, will have a budget special in, uh, if you're interested in that. And I'm hoping that, uh, and I believe that, he will be smart enough to realize the only way, the only way to fix our fiscal problems is to grow this economy at a rapid rate of knots. But to do that, you're going to have to rein in Cosato. The trade unions have, they have more power than they, they actually warrant. Uh, apparently, there's a new toy in the market. It's called a Cosato toy. It's one of these wind up figures. Uh, you, you sort of um, wind it up and you put it on your desk. It's a Cosato toy. It does nothing for eight hours. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Rudolph. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, I do think that the, that infrastructure, the rolling out of secure infrastructure into urban edges and outlining areas and looking at unlocking potential opportunities uh, for land development and local municipality, you know, they do play, they do play an important 
an important role in what developers can develop, where these opportunities lie for this growth to happen. Um, and I think, you know, at the end of the day, like you're saying, it comes down to a bit of a rands and cents discussion. And uh, and as we move into the sort of closing of our webinar, we don't you know, to keep in our time. I think uh, the question then goes back to Cole about the way in how much does it cost? Has developed guarantee products and insurance products that you're offering the real estate industry have you taken into consideration COVID and have you re-looked at this model and what are the type of key indicators or the key dis the key factors when it comes to analyzing a project perhaps we can round it off with that yeah so um for us it's it, it's always a, a balance between the risk and the likelihood of that risk occurring right and so um, i don't we don't necessarily see that uh, from from a developer perspective and that's why i spoke about the opportunities up front and how uh, sort of really bullish we are I just want to get rid of this thing on my screen real quickly um is that we don't necessarily see that, that may, maybe the development risk has has changed but what has changed are international factors and, and access to capital is still there but um, our funders as reinsurers is certainly more expensive um, a, a number of reinsurers as you know would have taken some some hard hits through this through, through the pan pandemic uh, last year secondly um, the cost of funding then means our own cost of capital uh, against providing these guarantees has gone down that's the reality so all in all all things being equal our guarantees on average are cheaper than where they were uh, two years ago or 18 months ago there's there's no two ways um, about that but again it, it comes down to our assessment of the risk and what are what types of risk are we mitigating against or what are the risks that we are insuring against now I, I, I just want to go back I, I think um, you know to touch on some of the question you asked before um, in terms of infrastructure and power and access to, to water and all of those things I do think our developers in South Africa are experienced enough to handle those challenges those challenges have been there for for a long time uh, does it play a part um, yes it does in, in terms of feasibility in terms of cost and and getting those things going but uh, most of our developer clients have have been in this you know have been in this environment for long enough to navigate through the, through those challenges in any way. so just i know we're ending off just a question though but when you say about your in the past your developer clients navigating and i think this brings up an important part you know we're mentioning that the the economy we need to get get growing we need everything to get going I think part of that is also changing the kind of uh, current uh, policy when it comes to, to to the development of the economy. But similarly, a current policy to where we put our guarantees and where we put our funding. If we are continuously supporting developers that have a long history of developing in our country, what is happening to this youth market of growing developers? Uh, you know, women in development who don't traditionally get the type of funding, um, you know, younger developers. Um, so, so do you have a strategy to towards that side of the market and growing that uh, consumer base? The short answer is yes, we do. Um, so we've recognized that, that not, not everybody, not every property developer is developing for the last 20 years. But they may have great opportunities so we have to recognize that and, and the project and uh, maybe a really good project and it's feasible to do it so uh, we do tailor our product for that um, must remember we're we're a facilitator of funding right and so we do have strong relationships with funders however the reality is right now as to and it goes back to the question of access to 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 the funding and the conundrum that we kind of find ourselves in at the moment is access to that funding during difficult times um, is is where track record and security around that is certainly looked at by by the by the funders and the funding organizations so they will take their view on on that but we do have a solution that 
does take into account, let's call them newer developers, and where we take a, a view on the project itself as well. So we can tailor tailor the, the you know the product to that for sure. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Boete. Any last comments? Um, I, I, I must tell you that um, I would like to, to advise the viewers that nobody in the world can ever prepare for what we had to endure last year for a pandemic. You can't prepare for a pandemic like this. But what you can do, you can prepare for a pandemic that passes. Are you going to be ready in a couple of months time from now for the next consumer boom? Uh, on the back of a commodity boom, which is helping South Africa a lot because of the platinum future for, you know, for hydrogen, uh, electrolysis, etc. I mean, this country has a magnificent future ahead. Um, and by the way, the Australians don't want this anymore. So that's good news for the average IQ for both countries. Thank you. Um, I don't know if the Australians wanted us in the first place. I think we just descended upon them like everyone else does. Um, thank you so much. I, I, there have a few questions have come up in the chat. We'll, we'll ask our uh, panelists to just to answer them um, off the chat group there, so they will be included. Um, we've hit our time, so thank you very, very much to everyone who's joined us this morning. Um, thank you so much to the panel for putting your time aside and for bringing your expertise and sharing those expertise with us. And and that is one of the one of the benefits uh, that has definitely come out of uh, the COVID pandemic, if one can even say that, is our ability to be able to have these digital forums where we can share and grow as an industry. So thank you so much to everybody, to everyone else. Please keep an eye open on Estate Living. We'll be hosting various uh, discussions and chats with relevant experts over the coming weeks. And if you have anything that you would like to be covered uh, during one of these discussions, please feel free to share that with myself. And um, we will record this session. We will share that with recording with everybody. And, um, and of course, uh, Richard, we have seen your question. We will answer that question for you as well. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you for joining us.